My Family Thinks I'm Crazy, a podcast where I, your host, try to give you some tips on how you can explain all this weird, wild, crazy conspiracy stuff to the people you love most, because that's what I've been trying to do for the past 10 years with no success. I've been telling everybody that I got them in a shade. Like, oh, here we go, Mark. <laughs> Off again with you. Mark being Mark again. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, that's the thing about podcasts is when you're on the air, and it's like therapy, you know? If I can't talk to my family about this stuff, I'll talk to you, Matt, and all our listeners. Yeah. So, who are we talking about today, Matt? say they built all this out of wood and plaster known as staff they, <laughs> they, they, they went up so quickly because you can have staff plaster now this building that you're looking at had an elevator on the inside you're and telling me you're going to have elevators and taking people to the top of a building that's made out of wood and plaster like, it's like how fast is that going to collapse how long would that take today right now with a workforce of 5,000 guys to build wow. just that one thing and then you start adding everything else at the fair you know, everything else that's being built in Buffalo, you know, the ethnology building. Or the, I think that's next to the, I think the Temple of Music is the one beside it. That's where President McKinley was shot. So you had, a, you had an actually assassination of a president. This is the best there's ever been. And all those people before you are just a bunch of dumb, primitive savages. So you don't want to look into and think about what they might have been doing or known. Focus on your washing machine and your iPad and your dishwasher and your... And that's where majority of humans have come to. And in fact, the situation we're in the world with right now can't happen with a very aware cognitive population who is able to see there was a time in our past when we were way more advanced than we are now. And I, I want to move towards that, not towards somewhere where I'm being controlled and dumbed down even more. It's been like a two, three hundred year process of getting humans to forget what we what we have is power. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the My Family Thinks Some Crazy podcast. I'm your host, Mark Palmer, and on today's show, we have an author who's put together several fascinating books. He also happens to be a friend of my co-host on the Your Handbook for the Apocalypse podcast, Michael Wan. They both do a show together on Mike's YouTube channel called The Real Trilateral Commission, where Howdy Mikowski, Michael Wan, and Emily Moyer chop it up and each share their own perspectives on a variety of interesting rabbit holes, we'll say. And today's conversation was no different. Howdy joined us to talk about the ancient structures that he's visited in several different places across the globe. We also discuss the ancient origins of hockey in the Mi'kmaq culture and also their connection possibly to the Templars. And then of course we got into Tartaria. We talked about the world's fairs and Howdy is somewhat of an expert. He's been looking at this topic for several years now and it was really, really amazing to have him here to break it all down for us we talked about the st louis world's fair the chicago world's fair of course uh even the uh paris world's fair got mentioned and the original world's fair which took place curiously in bohemia right so in germany uh, we also know that our uh friends over at the skull and bones secret society maybe not friends uh, as much as uh foes but they're over there uh their origins are in bohemia as well very curious anyways enough of my ramblings stick around for the extended outro to hear me talk more we got a lot to say 
Uh, a lot has gone on in the past few days. Shout out to our sponsors. All of their information is in the description. You can get some tuning fork action from Audrey Lobdell, Akasha Goods with all of your holistic health accessories, and then Fru's Forest Bathing Service. And we'll talk a little bit more about all of that in the extended outro and so much more we got spirit animal names to give out for our new patrons shout out to them join the patreon if you want to support the show and join in on the telegram community it's growing more and more every day and we just did our first patrons only meeting so if you want to do both uh, sign up for the patreon and then you get access to our exclusive patrons only telegram chat and the monthly Zoom meeting. Enjoy this awesome conversation with Howdy Mikowski, author of The Power of Then, Falling for Truth, A Spiritual Death and Awakening, and of course, Exposing the Expositions, 1851 to 1915. That was the majority of the conversation we spent talking about that book. But we also touched on the power of then and, of course, Howdy's really powerful near-death experience, which he was kind enough to share with us here on the show. So a lot to get into and so much more left off the table. So go over to Egyptian-wisdom-revealed.com to check out Howdy's books. You can also go to YouTube, Howdy Mikowski Talks. All the links are in the description. So without further ado, folks, enjoy this conversation with Howdy Mikowski. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the My Family Thinks I'm Crazy podcast. With us today is a gentleman from all the way across the pond and even further who's been studying everything from ancient cultures to not so ancient cultures and everything that's been erased or rewritten in between how are you today well, like i say it's a, i'm a bit cold it's very rainy very stormy but now if my chores are done i'm inside and oh we can see what we come up with as we deal with a world spiraling into insanity yeah yeah this is kind of uh hopefully a relief from that in our own little internet microcosm here but yeah not much different down here so you got into this whole subject from what seems to me an unconventional angle. Can you take us back to that experience with the river and, and maybe talk about who you were before that experience? Well, it was, it, it starts much, much before that. Well, let's that's, get into it. Like a, that was a changing actually the, you know, my life was normal yet, not normal hockey player and a comedian for most of my life and had a challenging life situation. So I had a psychopathic father, which created a, a lot of just really messy experiences around, you know, we don't want to go into it, but, you know, a lot of messy experiences of having someone like that as your role model, right? And I had a, I had a difficult time getting through university because of that. I, I, I did finish, I got my history degree, but it was very hard getting through that. And then just as I ended that, my, my, my ex-girlfriend at the time got murdered. And so when I had, when I was dealing with sort of all of these things at once, real, a real different seeking already began. This was 30, 25 years ago, 25 years ago. Yeah. Where you have to look at the world is presented at, this is how you're supposed to live. This is what you're supposed to do. This is how you're, this is how you succeed. And here I had seen someone who was following all the right rules, doing everything the way she was supposed to do. And now she's dead. And I really had to start saying, I don't think the rules we've been taught then can be the rules, you know, it, it just doesn't make sense. So I spiraled for a while because of that. I actually, I, I went to Australia for a year, spent time there. I, I was trying to make my comedy career happen. Nothing happened with that. And I spiraled into a really deep depression in like 97, I guess. And in the midst of it, I, I thought I, I, I just want to kill myself. I don't want to be in this world anymore. And I didn't like how I was becoming. I was becoming more and more beat, more and more manipulative with the people I was around. I just didn't like the person I was seeing in the mirror now, but I couldn't think of a nice, easy way to do it. So I was just, I was still waiting to try to figure out how could I do this when, when a program on ancient Egypt came on and that program changed my entire trajectory of my life. Because as soon as I saw that program, I knew that's what I'm supposed to do. My life is here for this and ancient Egypt has the secrets and I have to dedicate my life to 
finding it to, to, you know, to cut this short so you can start asking some questions. So I got very lucky because right from the beginning, even though I had a history degree, I, I quickly rejected the standard archaeological presentation of ancient Egypt. I saw that it was obviously false. Was lucky enough to bump into people like John West and, and Graham Hancock and, and uh, Schwaller de Lubitz and a number of people who were writing on a very different view of, age, of the ancient world. From there, I was lucky enough to meet and spend time with a Korean Zen monk with several native Indian medicine men, several Qigong doctors from China, you know, shaman people from the Amazon. And in the course of about six years, was digging into the ancient world and digging into really difficult exercises. I was very obsessed with my time. I mean, you know, I didn't read Carlos Castaneda's books. I lived them. I actually put them into practice, all of their exercises. I was putting 16 hours a day of my time into just exercise. At the end of the end of that period ended with my book on ancient Egypt and me thinking I knew quite a bit about the world. The next experience you're talking about showed me that I didn't, but that's where I was for the first period. So I just want to see if you have questions or something that starts from, from that before I go into the next. Yeah, segment. yeah, absolutely. Graham Hancock and John Anthony West, very familiar, but Schwaller de Lubitz might not be as familiar to the listeners. I have a, a book by his that might be one of the first books on the subject that I ever bought. And it was so over my head, Howdy. I'm still looking into this book like, hmm, what is this mean? Is it one of the big ones like on Luxor or Karnak? Like one of the, because he has this smaller one, something like the Temple in Man. It's a little book. And then there's like the Temple of Man, which is like about 2,000 pages. I have and the small one. Intense. You have the small one. Okay, I don't yeah. know what that that's says about me, but <laughs> if you read the bigger one, if you read the one that's like where he's not trying to to tone down his language, it just it's almost impossible to figure out what the hell he's talking about. Well, and this leads me to my question, which is do you think that the energy is lost? Because it seems like folks like yourself, Graham, John Anthony West, and the rest of them go to this place, whether it's in Egypt or, or the many other megalithic sites around the world. And it seems like there's some sort of invisible college that's going on there where, you know, a level of uh, intelligence or curiosity is required, but then rewarded through these sort of sites. That's a good way of putting it, I guess. I can say that every really ancient site I've been to, like, you know, there's I've now seen that there, I, I divide the ancient world into sort of a, a really old 10 or 15,000 or more year old period, period where the really large structures were built and the perfect megalithic building happened. And then there was a second period that we, that archaeology tries to piece all that into, but that's a, that's a completely separate period. So when I'm at those really old sites, be it Teotihuacan in Mexico or Dashu or Abu Sir or something in Egypt. It's like I'm stepping into another universe, to a complete other reality. And I know the energies aren't even still like, you know, at, at their at their original state. They're they're, you know, quite toned down, but it's still strong enough that you I literally feel I'm somewhere else, that I'm not in this reality when I'm there. And uh, and I think Partially, all you, uh, the only the only place I've been to that's a supposedly ancient site that has no energy is Stonehenge, but we can talk about that, of course, later, as you know. But all the other ones are uh, uh, almost equivalent to like you're on fire, or at least for me, I'm on fire when I'm there. And I think you don't have to do too much when you're at these sites necessarily. My advice to a lot of people that go is try not to go to tour group. Try to be there by yourself. Try to find a place in the site where you can just go and not be bothered by anyone sit down, shut up, and just let the site talk to you. And generally, anyone who does that has some kind of experience. So I think whatever the energies are, because they're, they're even beyond, I've studied this for like 20 plus years, and I still have no clue what's going on at these places, right? But I think if you're there and you spend, really openly spend time day after day after day, it will open up to you and you will start, you will get stuff revealed to you. Right. Yeah, and they are so anomalous, I'm sure. It'll take many, many decades before we get some answers on that kind of stuff. And probably technology on our end needs to stop devolving. <laughs> I was going to say improve, but I have heard you talk about this before, and it kind of fits into what you just mentioned, where there is two clear time periods with these sites. There's the 
site or the time period when the megalithic construction occurred and then this sort of afterwards period where it seems almost like people found it built and just said oh this is cool we should live here and they start building you know structures on top that don't seem to match the quality or even the building you know capacity like with the tools and the materials it's a totally different uh yeah. culture it seems yeah, and, and it's something I didn't, even when I wrote my Egypt book, I didn't fully understand that. I, I I knew they were older, but I was pushing the, like, say, Old Kingdom Egypt. Well, I was pushing Old Kingdom Pharaonic Egypt farther back in the past. I wasn't realizing that Pharaonic Egypt has a particular start point, and these things are from before that. And, yeah, so if you go to, once I got really good insights of this, and, and a researcher from um, Russia who's who died a few years ago, he he was outstanding with what he was doing. I put him above all the guys we mentioned before. He's now at the top of the list. And he was the one who revealed to me anyway, like when I'm at Saqqara and you can see at the Pyramid of Yunus, you can see these giant, massive, perfectly placed blocks. I mean, they are, they are perfectly cut granite, perfectly laid. And then you basically got what you might as well call a pile of rubble on top of it. And I realized what I'm looking at, oh yeah, the bottom part is the old thing that was there, the thing that was there 10,000 years ago, which was somehow destroyed. And when Pharaonic Egypt came, they were trying to rebuild it, and this is the best they could do. And even though Pharaonic Egypt, you might say, Old Kingdom Egypt is more advanced than us, more advanced energetically and, and knowledge of the universe and knowledge of this realm and the, simula and the simulation world and the matrix, and they still couldn't do what the, these, these old civilizations before them did. And that's, again, that, that when I finally got that, that actually started shaking me up quite a bit because it was, again, even to the time we like to be told we're at a peak, we're still, we're still a long ways away from whoever these people were that built the things originally. Right. Right. And it seems to be culture that spans continents because you see these sorts of megalithic anomalies in Central America, Africa. Asia, Europe, you know, so I'm wondering, are there any that you visited that maybe our audience wouldn't be familiar of? Obviously, the, you know, Great Pyramids are probably the most famous. Central American pyramids might be second famous, but you just mentioned a couple that obviously, I, I can't recall because the name's Darren Kuyu, right? That sounds a little like something I've seen on Ancient Aliens, but I can't put it to mind. But are there any that maybe go unnoticed that are worth mentioning? Oh, there's tons. Like, I mean, I, you know, I live here in Scandinavia now and I found like a hundred stone circles wow. just, uh, just in Norway and, and very and, and edge of Sweden. And, uh, the local population either doesn't know about them at all or kind of knows they're there, but just ignores them. Mm. And in many cases, the energies are as strong as the ones you find in England, not as strong. The ones in England, because the stones are a little larger, or, and, and but still, we're dealing with big stones in this part of the world, and the energy is quite clean because nobody goes, so nobody's nobody's ruining the energy. So I've had a lot of really interesting experiences with people who've had problems, illnesses, uh, injuries that have been miraculously almost you know fixed by going to these sites and spending time at. If I was going to pick a couple of sites that people probably don't know about that they likely should, the first one would be a place in Mexico called Cholua, which is like uh, an hour east of Mexico City. If you're in Mexico City, people are normally going to, to Teotihuacan or to Tula. But if you go the other direction, that's where the actual by size, largest pyramid in the world is. And it is... It's, it's really, really strange because it, you can go through these tunnels, these massive, and not like tunnels downward, they're like straight tunnels that move you all through the pyramid, which are claimed to have been built, uh, dug out by researchers or explorers or whatever you call it. But the, the, the tunnels are, you know, actually lined with, with like a cement and, 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 and it's been roofed and it's obvious an explorer doesn't do all this. They're not going to do that kind of work. And these are parts of the original structure. And the same thing, when you go out in the back, there's these really interesting temple areas that have just kind of been excavated. It's a really unique site that I, nobody would ever go to. You right. know, so like that one's off the top of my head. Now, the other would be Abu, Abu Sir in Egypt, which 
generally you can't get to. You've got to pay somebody a bunch of money to get to it. But Abu Sir and Abu Ghura maybe are the actual oldest site. They might even be older than Giza. They don't look it necessarily because a lot of it is ruined. But what's so weird about like Abu Sir is you'll there's a there's a weird temple at Abu Sir. I'll explain it to you. So what you have is a layer of granite, and then you had a and then you had a layer of limestone. So that's how they built the walls. Okay. So the granite's on the inside, the limestone's on the outside. The granite is melted, like it's melted. In the whole room, you just see little elements of like running, you know, hardened granite. And the limestone is mostly okay. <clears throat> it's a little bit flaked and chipped. So that means it didn't come from the outside. It's not because that would have destroyed the limestone, right? It's not right. some sort of heat blast. You could say, oh, it's some energy weapon or whatever. It's from the inside. So something inside this little temple space got so hot, it melted granite, but wow. didn't melt the limestone on the outside of it. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So it's stuff like that as you go to these sites and you, you see this stuff and you're like, well, and you, you know. can't imagine, I mean, and this kind of was what I was thinking of asking after you mentioned the explanation for those tunnels under the largest period pyramid in Mexico, you know, begs the question, who and why are they going to these sites and why are they obscuring purposely information? And I wonder how far these groups have gone to obscure evidence of the past. I mean, in this case, there's still something there, but those are sites that most people don't even go visit. I don't know what the parameters are there. Maybe they're trying to preserve its age, but at the same time, yeah, that sounds like something technological to me. I mean, I'm reading right now The Grid of the Gods by Joseph Farrell and uh, Scott D. Hart, and <clears throat> there's a lot of energy significance to the pyramids, according to them. And then you have, like, cases where, you know, allegedly Napoleon Bonaparte shot the nose off of the Sphinx, and it, it's like, well, what's the what's the point of this kind of stuff if, if these— buildings weren't if they were merely decorative they were merely you know for looks then why go this length of destroying and obscuring them yeah so there's kind of two questions there and i'll get to those uh, two questions the first would be i think this stuff is being purposely hidden it has been purposely hidden for a long time because we're talking about a time when humans had great power this is a time you know Aliens didn't build these. They, they weren't, you know, the, the, the humans had, okay, assuming, okay, we have to assume, of course, we had, because I talked about this before, that it's possible these things are from so far early in the simulation that they they were not actually built, that they were placed in by by the, almost like the program that created this reality we're in, right? We're, we're in like the equivalent metaverse of Facebook, but we don't know it. But wh whoever originally, because they're copies of something from then at least, up, you know, the next level up, of the simulation certainly humans created these things and, and had a power that still like you can still touch that's there and the problem is if humans can retouch this power again retouch the actual complete use of our energy and our mind and our you know our spirit there's no way we accept this crappy world like this crappy world is instant why would i want this junk when i could be creating a part of like a group that's creating that, that's creating a world of harmony and balance. And I, I would assume just from being at these sites, someone living there when everything was in place, when all the statues were in place, when, when everything, I don't think anyone got sick. I mean that quite seriously. I, yeah. I, I just can't see how you could get physically ill at one of these sites because as soon as your energy began to drop, the site would just like course correct whatever was happening. So, of course, if you want to have a world where you control, control people, you have to have a world where people don't think they have any power. It's best to think whatever you got now, this is the best there's ever been, and all those people before you are just a bunch of dumb, primitive savages. So you don't want to look into and think about what they might have been doing or known. Focus on your washing machine and your iPad and your dishwasher. And, your, and that's where majority of humans have come to. And in fact, the situation we're in the world with right now can't happen with a very aware cognitive population who is able to see there was a time in our past when we were way more advanced than we are now. And I, I want to move towards that, not towards somewhere where I'm being controlled and dumbed down even more. So right. 
it fits. So it sounds like we're just talking about something that's kind of interesting off the cuff. It's but it relates to where we are right now and and then the challenges we're at. This 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 destruction of ancient knowledge is a huge part of putting into place where we are. It's been like a two, three hundred year process of getting humans to forget what we what we have as power. Right. It's almost like what you see on a smaller time scale happen to wild animals in a zoo. You know, I wonder if if they if they pen them next to uh, an actual wild animal of their species, would they be as demoralized and uh, well behaved or tamed as the they like to put it? as uh, they are now. You know, if they had the example of their wild brethren, maybe they would stir up more <laughs> chaos in the zoo pen, yeah. you know? Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, it's it's very interesting to think that modern cities are human zoos. That's partially what, what these are. Well, Keep and- humans in, Yeah, in a particular pen, a particular frequency, in a particular thought pattern, and not too often do you know, like my wife got really hooked on the Ben Fogel shows, the guy who would go and, and meet people who are like living in the middle of nowhere, right? They literally live away from everything and they, they survive and are extremely happy. And I think even seeing something like that in a television show, never mind meeting one for real, seeing them in a television show would be similar to those animals. It stirs something internally of like, that person is free. That person is actually living more similar to the way they're supposed to live without all of this contraption around us. And there's a draw to, I wish I was living like that. Right. And there's some, there's a similar freedom in the idea that our society, our civilization, or us as human beings are much, much older than we are told. And, you know, one example of this and I, I know this might not even be proven. The radiocarbon dating is a little speculative, uh, according to some. But the Tartaria tablets, have you heard of these Tartaria tablets that they found that maybe allegedly go further than Sumeria, like something like 10,000 to, to 100,000 years beyond earlier than Sumeria, these Tartarian tablets? No, I just I'm just looking them up now that you just told them to me. Yeah. I have, Reportedly discovered at a Neolithic site in the village of Tartaria in Romania. How interesting is that? Yeah. Well, <laughs> I'm going to have to look into that after we have this interview because that's something that instantly is now telling me. I I'm just taking a quick look at them and they kind of look almost like runes. They look uh, mm. they look quite similar to to Scandinavian runes. And when you deal with runes, you're also dealing with a, a very old language known as Ogam, which most people don't understand. So when you go and look, uh, there's also a lot of petroglyphs here in Scandinavia. So if you see a, a petroglyph, you'll often see like a stick figure, and then they have lines or whatever, lines and dots around them. They come off them, right? Mm -hmm. And people think, oh, that's their clothing. That's their, that's the language. That's the act of the language is there. And if you know, it's almost like a dot and dash, almost system like Morse code. If you know the language, you can read all of these petroglyphs. I am now pulling up a picture of a similar, and this is in, this is very close to me. I live on the East Coast in New England and, and this is yeah, in Massachusetts. There, yeah. yeah, there's, there's a, thank you. There's a, a rock, a 40-ton boulder called the Dighton Rock, and it has what some researchers say look could only be explained as rune stones on the side of it. So when you brought up the, the ogum, I'm like, well, let me show you this and see what you think. Have you ever seen this Dighton Rock before? No, I've never seen it before. So now this isn't the best picture of it here, but, but as you can see, there's a lot of very strange sort of even diagonal. There's some X's right there. Some people have said, oh, look, it, it, it's similar to runes, even this little flag kind of backwards P shape right there. You know, it almost looks more similar to slightly to the weird hieroglyphic language that was found on Easter Island, mm. which was, uh, you know, okay, so now we're getting... Oh, no, okay, so yeah, these are, I've seen some of this kind of stuff in Scandinavia, particularly the way the, the figures are drawn. But when we talk about Ogam, I don't see anything that jumps at me as Ogam. As, as so, so my guess is whatever this is, it's something a little different. But well, there's, and it's there still unexplained. It. It's still unexplained, and I'm glad you, you're making this sort of a connection to its resemblance because what I thought 
when looking at this over the past few months is maybe there was some sort of intercultural mixing melting pot between the native americans and the northern europeans and in this sort of part of the world new england there was maybe some sort of trading language that they had where it wasn't quite what they spoke to each other it wasn't quite what the northern europeans spoke to each other but when they met they used this as a sort of trading language okay that's the one this is showing you it's the same as egyptian hi egyptian hieratic wow that this is a cell, because you can see underneath is is being listed. They're they're sort of this is in German, but they're 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 showing that it's the Lord's Prayer in the Micmac script. But if you took this into Egyptian hieratic or ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics, it's the same. Wow! And for those who don't know, am I correct? The Micmac are from Nova Scotia. Nova Scotia. So wow. yeah, so not far away. So same same kind of connections would have been there. Right. with where you're at in New England. Like, go back to the hieroglyphic page and let's just see. There might be one where it actually shows the, the Egyptian. Well, here you go, the fourth one. So fifth one down where it says Book of Mormon mm. underneath. Uh, so if you go four across that one, yeah. So it's showing, for example, you're seeing the difference between wow. the word in, in Egyptian and the word in the Micmac. Yeah, wow, that is, I mean, that's pretty much spot on. I, wow. Yeah, and, and there's a lot of it. And when so you've you got that problem, we've got the Micmacs with it with an Egyptian hieroglyphic language, and then their flag, because the, no almost no Indian tribes have a flag, but the, the Micmacs had a flag. The flag is exactly the same as the Templar, Knights Templar battle flag. Wow. There is no difference between them. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. This is, I mean, it, this screams Templar. I'm gonna share this as well. Wow. Yeah, and you know, you even look at why, some of why the. Why would a native Indian tribe in Nova Scotia have a flag like that, or a flag at all? As you put, you know, that's not really a common practice. It doesn't really seem like there'd even be a need for it. You know, uh, they don't that have. Is, that is the Templar, the Templar flag. Yeah. Wow. You know, another thing that makes the third part really strange about the Micmac is because the Micmac are also really claimed to be the creators of the sport of hockey. That it's it's from the Micmac that hockey originated from. For 50 years, they were the only ones who made hockey sticks, as they claim like they were the only ones who knew how to make them. So if you needed sticks, like it, it's supposedly the story of hockey starting in Montreal, but they had to they had to call the Micmac in Nova Scotia to send them all their sticks. So now you're starting to take back, okay, why does this particular tribe invent this particular sport? Is that linked to some sort of ancient Egyptian? Is it linked to something from the Knights Templar? Where is this? What? Why? It just adds a second piece when you talk to the Micmac as an example of what did they really know and who were they connected to? And yeah, so if you if you, you increase that, like I can't remember what the tribe would be in sort of New England, what the main tribe would be there. But I don't doubt if you if you did some digging, you would find a lot of similar strange things well, within the, within the native within their specific culture and language and whatnot that would be very. Yeah. You know, European, you might say. I would agree. And I've been looking into a lot of this stuff uh, lately. There's a multitude of tribes, but they're usually called uh, the Algonquin people because of the language group. But right. there is a group called the Penascabat who lived in a similar area to the Micmac, and they made their way south into my area. So I would imagine they would have some side of some sort of connection. And they're a little strange in comparison to other groups but the other thing that i wanted to point out about the micmac is they were purportedly very tall pale skin and and had a sort of war paint on them when they were first encountered by the by the french who were you know i don't know maybe they're coming from the south through the the united states or the great lakes region but they were really shocked at this Micmac group because of how large they were in comparison to some of the other tribes that they have found. So many, many anomalies with this group of people. Wow. So we, we started by talking about Ogham and we made it all the way over into New England. I definitely wanted to touch on that, but let's go back to, to Europe because the stone circles are fascinating. I, I know there's a lot of stone work here we can spend uh, time talking about later, but tell me more about some of the ancient stuff you're finding in Norway. Is that why you went up there? Are there multiple reasons why you moved there? Or, or... Yeah, various reasons, but that was, 
it was interesting enough to also have something that kind of was ignored, you know, to know you have an ancient site and, and they're ignored. Yeah, it, it's really, what's interesting is that, because now we're, now the Norway-Sweden border has a particular place of dividing it, but of course in the ancient world, there was no such divide, dividing line. So there's a huge bit just above the northern border. And then when you go south into Sweden, you have another section and they're, they're completely different. The energy at all those sites are completely different based on whether you're north or south. They are generally though, because after being to the ones in England, they don't have the strength. A place like Avebury, like Avebury in England has an unbelievable strength. And I haven't been to the ones in Scotland, but I would assume their strength is. So these aren't as strong as Avebury, but it's more like you, you have to give these ones time. So you won't notice it in five minutes necessarily. You're going to notice it over an hour, two hours. You're going to start noticing that your body is taken in a lot of this, the energy of it. one is really interesting. One site known as the Hun because it's laid out like a serpent. There's still, there's nine stone circles left, but I managed, I've managed to track them all the way to the, uh, to the ocean, to the fjord. So it, you probably, you landed there and then you would walk the entire length of the serpent, which I've done a few times. I walked from the from the fjord all the way to the end. And it's completely different than just going from the parking lot and seeing the nine. When I walk from, from the end and I get, you know, it takes about 10 or 15 minutes and then my back's on fire. Like I'm literally burning as I make it to the, to the last one. So it's telling me, it's telling me combination of that. There's still great energy at these sites, but more importantly, if we just take this place, it doesn't matter where we go. Like, I mean, native Indian medicine wheels and North America and mounds and, and whatever. Right. So when, you know, and, and there's, say there's what I found a hundred, right? There probably were thousands of them at one point in this part of the world. What, what would that energy have been like when you've got a thousand active sites, all interconnected, intermingling with each other? Again, what kind of, what kind of harmonizing force are you getting from that and protective force and, and, and whatnot? And, and to me, they're, they're built by the same people who built the ones in England. There, there's no difference. They, they weren't built earlier or later, they were all built around the same time, same time frame, And they're interesting to go to, because like I say, one great thing about stone circles, even most of England, you can go there alone. You can, you can be at these sites where there's like nobody. Okay. That's how you want to see a site, possibly see it. It's right. Go there by yourself. Right. And, and we're given in, you know, traditional archaeology, the explanation that these sites are purely astronomical. They were purely agriculture, but all it takes is a firsthand experience to go there and experience the energy. Now, in the case of these archaeologists, I mean, what's their excuse? Because, you know, they're human beings, too. I mean, unless college completely deadens their ESP senses, which I don't think that happened for you, sir with all due respect, like what, what is going on? Where's the disconnect with these mainstream archeologists not recognizing the energy? I think it's two things. I think one, there is a disconnect. Before I went to university, I was unbelievably creative, like extreme creativity. And, and I was, it was a really big decision when I went, did I, would I want to go to, to university combination, play hockey and get that kind of degree? Or did I want to go to a college and take maybe something like script writing or or, you know, now documentary film, make something much more creative. And I chose the history route. By the time I was finished those four years, my creativity had died. I was very, now become very logical. I become very good at research, which has helped me, of course, in the, in the rest of my life, learning how to research. But the creativity is still never come back. So I do know you, you, you lose something because particularly university forces you to conform. Very much. You have to, you have to fit in and you have to fit in with the system and the paradigm. So if you're going through something like archeology span and you want to, you want to talk up and say, you know, I think the pyramids might be 10,000 years old and aren't burial places for Kings X, you fail. You, you don't get a chance. To, you wouldn't get a chance to explain on your paper, what you mean the, the professor saying, I totally disagree with you, but give it a shot. You know, I want to see your thought process just automatically X wrong. So. You've got that to start with, that you can't even get through your degree unless you, in a sense, agree with the, with the standard professors. Now, the professors are stuck because the professors are now in such a point where the people above them, right, the people who run the archaeological places of the world are, send, are feeding the, the message, feeding the information. And here's the professor who's making 
a lot of money, doing not very much, writing a few books, teaching some classes, has a really cushy life. If all of a sudden the professor comes up and says, you know what, all the stuff I've been teaching for 30 years is completely wrong. It's crap. They're probably just going to get fired. And generally, you're not going to know what a, a, a university professor really thinks until they are retired. Now, once they've retired, you now get the opportunity, if you can know them, they may not say it openly and put it in a book, but they might tell you, yeah, you know, I was teaching all this stuff, but... I, I, I really think something completely different is going on. I think the paradigm is so tight. The box is so tight. You've got half of them that have been indoctrinated. They can't see anything else but what they want to see because it's good for their careers, good for their pocketbook, so they wouldn't think of changing. The other group, it's still good for their pocketbook. They see problems, but they, they're, they're just a little frightened that if they try to go outside of it, they're going to get squashed. Right. So I think that that's where you're at with pretty much mainstream anything that deals with anything scientific, because once you start going on what you can call a truth journey, a journey where, because you don't find truth. If you want it, if you're really looking for truth, you have to find false because you don't know what truth is. All you can know is what's, what's, you can find false though. Find what's not true and get rid of it and move on. That's, that's the journey. And so once you start looking at anything, it doesn't matter whether you look into science, religion, history, education, law, government, money system, you know, it doesn't matter. It's all a lie. It's all false. Nothing in it is, has almost any truth to it. It's not completely false. There's little pieces of it in there, but it's surrounded by so much garbage that it's, it's a, it's a journey just to pull out anything that's really true in any of them. And so that's the problem with anything. It's like, it doesn't matter what you study. If you're a truth seeker, if you really want to be a truth seeker, it doesn't matter what you study, what area you study. You've got so much false staring in your face that if you just pick a, pick a direction and go ahead, you, you'll, you can reach the same point. It's just you've chosen to, to dig here instead of here. That's all. Right. Right. And, you know, we hear a lot about here in the States, the Smithsonian Institute being behind a lot of these cover ups, but. You know, it really feels like the academic establishment in general, like you just laid out, is set up in that way to minimize any potential of, you know, an offshoot from the main, you know, course, right? Like, here's here's the direction we're going in. If anybody goes off course, you're, you know, by yourself, goodbye, la la, you know, and unfortunately, that has, you know, left a lot of people in the dark on where our history is and you know i think that's absolutely or absolutely intentional you know to take the population and make them null you know they don't have as you put before these energy sites they don't have the the connection to these energy sites so now we're gonna nullify the people themselves right we've already kind of gone out of their way to nullify the grid now it seems like they're nullifying people and Obviously, the university is a is a great way to do that because folks who don't go to school, they're just left to trust <laughs> what these people of authority, you know, deem to be true or not. So, yeah, it's quite a crazy situation we're in. Fortunately, I, I now have to turn off most documentaries I would ever watch. I, I get through five minutes and I just I can't even watch it because I know it's 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 it's, it's indoctrination. It's propaganda. Right. That's all it is. It's not real research. It's just, and so, so, so that's kind of what I was doing for six years. I was digging into all of this kind of stuff. And like I say, I was doing exercises either designed to work and understand the body and the mind, how that was working, or a lot of it was designed to try to get an answer on what reality is. What is this place? How real is it? Can I, can I prove that it's real? So I, I, it was intense, the stuff that happened. And I mean, I, I got to breaking points a number of times where very strange things started to occur. Like when you start pushing reality to test it, it'll show you that. Well, you, you mentioned the, the Castaneda books and I read those too. Well, there's like 12. So I read the first one <laughs> and, and one that stood out, one moment in the book that stood out was when Don Juan asked Carlos to find the purple spot, right? And Carlos is like, what the hell are you talking about? Find the purple spot, you know, and he's rolling around on the porch. He's looking for a spot, a purple spot. 
and he wakes up in the morning and he realizes he dreamt of the purple spot, something to that effect. But it was almost, I guess, in giving up, he found the truth. And I don't know what that tells us about being a seeker, but I like the way you put that. I hadn't heard that before. Find what's false and get rid of it, right? Because that's that's how, you know, it's how this this thing works. But yeah, Castaneda, sorry to, to derail where you're going, but Castaneda definitely is is a part of how I became who I am. Yeah, and it's, it's so interesting because so many people like you read the first book. I think it's not only the worst book in the series, it may be one of the worst spiritual books I've ever read. It's just, it, it's horrible in my opinion, but it's, and it's, and I think a lot of people read it and never continued for various reasons. But once you get into book two, it's already, you can see somebody different is writing the second book. The person who wrote book one is, is in sense, I know it's Carlos Castaneda, but it, it, he's different. By the time you hit book three, he's different. It's a, it's, it's a completely different book and a completely different message, particularly once he gets rid of the whole, the, the drug aspect of knowledge. By book three, he's saying, that's actually, you don't need that. It's, that's actually a detriment to you. And once he starts to move, like if you haven't read, for example, Journey to Ixlon as a Carlos Castaneda fan, which is book three, you should read that because that now really begins to present a complete package of, of information. Now, and I'm not going to say that because I've looked into Carlos Castaneda too, and he was a strange guy, really strange dude. It's a really strange things took place in his life. And so also for that, people dismiss the books because they look at the person and they say, well, this guy wasn't living a very, you know, very, very clean life, which is very true. Yeah. To me, cults I think and whatnot. Yes. The person, the, 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 the person, the, the, the person who wrote the books was one person, and that's a particular piece of information. The person who lived them was someone who couldn't really live the books, tried to, tried to, to, tried to pretend like they were, but couldn't. But within the books, for example, I mean, you know, I did, I did a life recapitulation. I took four years and did it. You know, when you talk about not doing or, or um, walking or pretty much everything that was in there, I did. I did and did them intensely. And in the course of doing those exercises and the time with the, with the native medicine men and the, and the things they were suggesting me to do and the things I was seeing in the sweat lodges, reality just was shown to be completely, if not fake, that we can at least say not solid and not very transparent. So I had gone through all of this and really had led to some breakdowns positively and negatively during that period while I was going through all this, as well as studying alchemy and hermeticism and you know, middle age, middle, middle, middle ages. Yeah. Alchemic texts. And then in 2005, after I'd been to Egypt to finish my book, that's when I had the experience where I fell in the Canyon. So I really felt that at this point I was quite knowledge and there was nothing like really the internet, like we have it now running. It was a much different internet then. And so you had to do lectures. I didn't do many of them. The book was selling itself you know, 10 copies a month or something, you know, but I thought it was pretty smart. Then I was hiking with a friend in the Rocky mountains. We were up in Johnson Canyon and uh, I slipped and fell into a, into a river that was there in the Canyon, not knowing that like 20 seconds or 10 seconds down the river was Canada's largest waterfall. So once I had fallen into the river, the, the speed of the water was beyond what I could have expected. And of course I realized pretty quickly what was on the other, what was on the, this side of the river coming. And I swam as hard as I could back to the shore to try to get my friend who was still shoreline to pull, pull me up. Right. And it was hard. I really had to swim like hard <clears throat> to get across the current, but I did make it, got to him. And just as I grabbed his hand, he slipped and fell into. And when he slipped and fell in, I, I still remember the words that came out. I was like, oh no, now we're in trouble. Because of course now I got nobody on the bank, and and the water just did just just pushed me, and at that point now we were dealing in microseconds. So well before I might have been dealing in seconds, now I was dealing in microseconds, and at that moment came realization: this is where I'm going to die. This is where I'm going to die, and isn't it interesting that the million ways you can die, this is how it's going to happen for me, and that's I just it was interesting. It was just like. There was no need to fight it, to try to keep living, to try to nothing. It was just like the sense of I'm going to die and I'm going to have front row seats to witness it. 
this is going to be interesting. As soon as I come to that acceptance of, of, of dying, everything I could think of as me left. Thoughts, memories, hopes, dreams, body sensations, everything that I could have classified, would have ever classified as me by identity or personality was gone, just vanished. What was left was a very powerful, you would almost call it witnessing awareness. So there was an awareness that was observing everything non-judgmentally, was just aware on a very high level. And there were these clusters of what I call information that were coming up. It wasn't like thought. It was like these pieces of complete something. And they, they burst in front of your eyes, like a, like almost like a painting of information. Just that's how, and so that was coming for a while. Then there, I got this feeling like almost the best way I can describe it is like a computer stick was stuck in the back of my head and a whole lot of data was downloaded into me at this moment, like massive amounts of data. I think that the book that became the world's fair book that I wrote 10 years after that, 15 years after that was part of that data download. It just took me 15 years to sort. And that's kind of still what I'm doing in some cases. I'm still sorting through my, the computer system of my mind as to, you know, what are all the files that got dumped onto here during this experience? So this was going on for a couple of seconds. It's this sort of really brief, but complete total moments of time. And then a new thought cluster came out. Again, I call it thought cluster, but it's wrong. Cluster of information that said, if I don't get out, how is my friend going to get out? Because he was still in the water kind of working to be in place. He was in a place where the water wasn't, it was hard enough that he couldn't get out, but it was, it was slow enough that he wasn't being pushed down the river like I was. So I was like, if I, if I don't get out, how's he going to get out? And at that moment, my leg hit, cause I was upright at this point. It wasn't like swimming. I was upright and my legs hit a boulder underneath an underwater, like giant boulder and deflected me a bit towards the shore. And my, my foot touched ground and I realized it was shallower than I thought it was. And I began kind of crawling out of the river, yelling at my friend, like trying to, it's shallow, it's shallow, climb out. And as I was running to find a tree branch or something to pull him in, I saw him, he was coming out too. And we both then just sat there for about an hour in complete silence. We just sat and, you know, dealt with what we had just experienced. Because he experienced almost the same thing I did. He, he accepted his death and almost similar things. And then we talked about it for a couple hours. We shared our complete experience. And again, it took two hours for both of us to share what was probably five seconds of time, right? Ten seconds of time. And then we, we walked out and my life has changed ever since because... Now, so many things that up to that point, like I had read a lot of alternative stuff, as you heard, a lot of very different stuff, but I read a lot of the, what you might call standard spiritual teachings, you know, the standard teacher and follow your meditation practice. And, and now after I've had this experience, I realized that all of these things are just designed to build this false construct, this thing that's obviously not me, none of it is who I am. Then does it, what actually has value in a real search for? self-knowledge and it took me first a lot of time to un unravel what have i learned what haven't i learned what's valuable what's not valuable did i know anything at all before this experience i went into some really difficult illnesses i went into some really difficult confusing periods from from after this for years and it's only like in the last maybe two years three years that i've kind of finally felt comfortable with what happened there comfortable with dealing with it in, in, a, in a way that I can come on now. And you know, I, of course, I talked about my experience 10, 15 years ago, but it came out very blotchy and at times very, in a very arrogant way where because of this, I'm better than you. And I'm, you know, and now it's just, I'm just sharing. Now I just share the experience or share what's come from it just as a sharing. There's been, it, it, but it's taken 10 to 15 years to, to deal with it. And that's, that's the experience you were mentioning at the start of the, of this program. Yeah. Wow. Thank you. And, and, you know, for folks who haven't heard that before, I, I couldn't help but include that in here because it is so powerful. And I hadn't heard that one part about, you know, you feeling arrogant and it's interesting to bring that up and, and say that now as somebody who clearly very humble, very kind, I'm learning a lot from you, howdy. So I didn't get that impression at all, but I can, I can understand that, you know, it's like, geez, you're getting th almost thrown off of a cliff there. I can imagine the water was 
probably freezing. Maybe it was summertime, but you can imagine the water wasn't very comfortable either. And and you survived this experience. And I mean, I've heard people have downloads before, but when you have a download sitting in your living room and in your, in your on your couch, it's a little different than having this kind of download where it almost seems like life is like hey, you're not done yet, mister. <laughs> like this is, this is supposed to happen. And they give you all this info. Clearly you're still sorting through. I mean, well, sort of, yeah, it, it's interesting because there was, I mean, there, what, there did become a decision, right? The decision was I had to get out. So my friend would get out. Right. So I really, I wasn't getting out for me. I was getting out the, 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 the force that I threw back in, you might say into play was for him. Right. So in a sense, you might say it's really, it's for others. And so I can now begin to see, like looking back after all this time, like two things happen. One happens when you have an experience like that, which is one reason I like to share it so often when people ask is you think your ego has been destroyed. Like it was gone. Like it was actually not there for a long period of months. It didn't exist. What you would call an egoic structure. And so you think it's gone. You think you, you somehow the experience has beaten it. All it's done is retreat it. It's, it's just waiting and it's rebuilding itself to sneak back in again. One of which usually happens is something that you classify as a spiritual ego or uh, in Zen, they call it spiritual drunkenness, where you've actually learned something, but now this new egoic structure is taking it and twisting it in a way that you don't even notice you're, you're taking it, twisting it. The other way to describe it is if you, if you take a look at if you think of your screen, as, as the total knowing, everything you can know. Well, that experience put a spotlight on this part of it. It like literally showed me everything there is to know about this. But because the screen is holographic, even to have this light up, the rest of it gets lit up too. So you, you, you believe, and in, in fact, in some truth, you have seen the totality. You can't see a part without seeing the whole of anything, right? But I get you get fooled because the light was, on, the light was clear on one place and the rest wasn't. It was, fu it was fuzzy. But this spiritual ego, created this thing of saying, yeah, oh, I know everything now. I got a glimpse of everything and, and, it, was all, and it was all clear. And had I had to taken enough time to just be still, I jumped back in the world way too quickly. Had I taken two, three, four months of just being really, really still, dealing with it, going back to talk to a lot more of my teachers and just yeah, integrating this experience and figuring out what was clear and what's fuzzy, that would have helped me right from the beginning because I would have known what I felt I could talk about with a little bit of authority and what's the other stuff I can say, yeah, I have these ideas or these theories, I, you know, I don't know. That's and, and that right away, as soon as you can start sharing that, once you're being more honest with at least what you feel comfortable in sharing and what you're saying, yeah, I've looked into that, but I, I don't know, you know, it, it, that's, that's where that part of that ego begins to get broken down because it's trying to hold on, you know, everything about everything when you don't. And it's just starting to learn what do you feel comfortable that you do know and what do you feel comfortable that you don't. And then it gets easier to start talking. Hence the name of the show, My Family Thinks I'm Crazy. You know, when you get into this world and you start learning about these conspiracies, you might get a big head and think like, I got to tell everybody about this. And and then you, you know, face a little bit of uh, confrontation and and, you know, maybe demoralizes you or maybe does what it does did to me and, and just fired me up even more and made me want to prove my case. But yeah, I, I wonder, you it know, it's challenging when I, when, especially we talk about the conspiracy side of it. So I got into that just after nine 11, I had, I had, I had another experience there where I was with the Zen monk in Hawaii. And so I was in Hawaii with him when this took place. And so it was, it was a pretty amazing place to be to have someone like this at this particular moment. And, and when I saw the TV, cause I, you know, Hawaii is like four or five hours behind the East coast. So when I finally got up, even though it was early, this had, this had been going on for four or five hours. So the, the, so the TV was just running the news of people I, I didn't know yet. And I just looked at it and it was like all the stuff I'd heard people have been trying to tell me about these conspiracy theories for years. And I just pushed them all out, you know, no, you know, you've you got to see reality as it really is. You guys are just making stuff up. But it was like, I, I, I still, it, it kind of came in, but I just, I didn't accept it, right? But I had heard it. I'd listened to them, but I didn't accept it. As soon as I saw that what was on TV, I just turned, it was like, to a couple of them there and said, guys are right. To all of it, all of it. It was like, it was like complete, total 
it was again, it was like that sort of not like I didn't get a piece. I got it all just, oh yeah. And then I spent about a year then digging into it to learn through 2002, just digging that through that experience. And now what I share with people, because that's happening to a lot of people now as the, as the, because I call what's happened now, we've had a frequency drop or many frequency drops that the, the, the actual frequency of the realm has gone down. So you're dealing with a much more dense, much more, much more non-thinking place, but not everybody takes the drop. People who have been doing work on themselves didn't take the frequency drop. So now the gap, when the gap used to be here between you and sort of the average person, the average person went here, they're off the screen. You stayed. You didn't evolve. Like the people, oh, all these people are waking up. No, they're, they're exactly where they've always been. It's just the, the world has gone down. Right. But now the gap is so huge, two things are happening. One, you can't talk to anyone anymore because now the gap is so wide between what you see and what they see. And more so, the problem is now you're higher on the, on the, in the view, you're higher in the sky. So you're seeing more. When before your, your view was limited, people are, are gaining so much information so quickly right now if they want to, that it, like you say, it can lead to some people, they get really depressed. Because it's so much stuff to take in. So many lies are, are being presented in front of their face instantaneously that it kind of just, their, their mind can't handle it, right? So they're going to really deep, depressive type places. And then the other is this idea, I've got to save the world. I've got to fix it. Or I've got to save my family. I've got to save all my friends. And they're going out there. I've got emails from a lot of people that are doing this. They're going out. And of course, they're met with extreme resistance. And all that's happening is they're getting sick. They're getting really tired, really exhausted, and actually ill from trying to save everybody instead of same thing. You've got all this new information. You've got this new understanding of where of what you're seeing of reality. You have to start learning what you're going to do with that, how you're going to handle it personally, and what you're going to share or not share with the world because you can't, you can't fix anyone that doesn't want to be fixed. That's step one. And, and, and really, if you're out there, please listen to this. You can't fix even, and it's just, this assumes, of course, that we're right. This assumes that I'm right. You're wrong. I know what you need. I, I have to fix you, right? You're, so that's also, it's also an egoic thing right away when we're thinking I have to fix or save you because I know more than the universe, right? I know more than God does kind of thing. And then when you try to do it, it almost never works. But if somebody comes to you and says, hey, I know you had these understandings or you've looked into this stuff. Can you tell me about it? The door's wide open and you won't have an energy loss. You won't have anything tiring. A really good example. Like generally, I do a lot of these interviews now. And of course, I make a lot of videos now. I'm up to like two or 300 videos or something. When I do any of these, I'm generally not too tired afterwards, even though I might talk for two hours. I, I, but if I go on the internet, for example, and I... I, I'm, and I'm not researching. If I'm just looking around, if I'm just wasting time, I could be on for 20 minutes and I'm like exhausted. I got to go to bed. You know, I'm just wiped clean. So it's another one of these things to always kind of be thinking. I'm like, your energy is finite. The ability, the, the energy you have available to you is finite. It's not endless. How are you using it? Where do you want to put it? Who do you want to interact with? How do you want to interact with them? And a, a lot of, what we're dealing with right now is you having to make those kind of decisions of what you want to do with your energy. Right. Right. Yeah. And you know, I, I probably say this every episode now, but David way, the Taoist monk who joined us on episode 26, he said, lead by example. Don't let them drag you down. Don't let them hold you back. They'll come around if they know what's best for them. And yeah, man, I, I love what you just said. It's so welcome here on the My Family Thinks I'm Crazy podcast because people who listen to this show relate to that title. It's why I named it that. And, you know, there's this like bullhorning phase that you go through when you learn about this stuff where you just, you got the bullhorn, you want everybody to hear you. And everyone's like, no, you're too loud, you know. And, and despite the fact that you might be right, Again, you know, I don't think Freemasons run the world, but I've had people on the show who talk about that, you know, maybe they're right about some things. And, you know, here we are. I think open mindedness is the way to go. Hearing people out and, you know, going back to these stone structures, these megalithic structures that have this ability to speak to us. 
you can't expect to learn anything if you go there shouting and you know like you said don't go with a tour group i mean maybe you got a big family you want to be a part of the gang or whatever but go there alone find a place where you can meditate and connect in a very silent way you know Hopefully you don't fall into a river, but I think that this is the kind of thing that that happens to people when they're receptive. You know, they get these downloads, whether it comes through a tragic, you know, life threatening situation or not. These things can't happen unless you're open, quiet and receptive. Right now on the point of the World's Fair, which you mentioned, you know, that kind of downloaded in to your consciousness in a way during that event, you know, it seems like they're almost trying to game the system. Like the, the leaders, the world leaders are trying to, you know, who was John Coleman on the higher, on the interverse that you guys did. It was a while back. He, he laid out a, a beautiful analogy for this. It's like the bookshelf behind me. If I took one book out off at the time and replaced it with another book, you know, one by one, little by little, you wouldn't notice that my bookshelf back there has changed at all because it would be very subtle. And I think that's kind of what's going on with these world fairs where they're slowly giving you this impression that, oh, you know, modern man is so great. Modern man, look at all the progression we've made. You know, forget about the noble savages, forget about the the people on, on the islands. And, and, you know, as a matter of fact, check them out. They're here in our human zoo. You know, bring the zoo idea back up, but... But yeah, it was very much like a reorganizing of the modern mind that took place in this time period. Yeah, it's again, when I started studying this in 2019, I've been in Florence studying cathedrals for a while, trying to understand how the cathedrals operate as machines. And I got back and I just bumped into the Chicago Exposition for some unknown reason. I was looking at cathedrals and it was just, it was insane. The, the size of the buildings, the, 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 you know, 700 acres of buildings built in two years and then destroyed. And then I thought, this has to be looked into. And it was only then I started realizing, well, wait a minute, they did this in Philadelphia, in Buffalo, in, in Nashville, in St. Louis, in San Francisco, or Buffalo, in Milan, in Paris, in London, you know, all over the world are having these fairs where they're supposedly building these giant structures and then just blowing them up with dynamite as soon as it made absolutely zero sense. And so at first I thought I was looking into an arch architectural question. I thought that's really what the, the, the whole thing was about. Who built them and, or did they get built or, or, you know, is this a remnant of an ancient civilization? But like you say, as I began to then go into the detail, because all of these fairs had like, they all had guidebooks that they go into like modern lonely planets. They had like, six or seven guidebooks. There were books written by historians, right? Your standard historian of the day would write a giant three or 4,000 page uh, document of, the, of each of the fairs. So you, all this stuff is available. Once I started reading those and you began to see what they're actually doing and presenting at these fairs from 1859 to 1915, you're realizing it's insane. Never mind the story of the building of them. What's actually there and being presented is insane. Right. I, I stumbled across one of these books that you're you're talking about in an antique bookstore in some farm town in Connecticut. And it was very, very interesting to see how much of the book was dedicated to talking about mongoloids and uh, what was the other term? Negroids. And, you know, just really sound like not terms that people want to be identified as at all. And then second of all, you know, obviously very sort of racially charged supremacists, maybe even eugenicist ideas about these other groups of people all in this Chicago World's Fair. It might not have been Chicago exactly, but it was it was a red. I remember it was a bright red cover, had a big Ferris wheel on the front and it was kind of an older book. But but yeah, a lot of information about the history of man and the the races of man that just didn't seem to fit with with the the cover of the book at all. Yeah, yeah these are these were really big things they did at the fairs. The Smithsonian specifically would set up these exhibits, and they would have skulls 
So they would have the primitive skulls of Africa and, and native Indians and the Polynesians. And of course, they'd be very small. You'd have the skulls of criminals. They'd be very small. Then you'd have one giant skull of a Victorian from England. And then they would measure your skull. I kid you not. They had these things and they would put them on your head and then they would show you which skull you were aligned to to show you how evolved you were as a person based on the size of your skull. This is an exhibit at all, at all of these world's fairs. You've got these weird baby incubators that they constantly wanted to show off these babies that are being right. kept alive through the, like, 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 what are they actually doing with this technology? Because you've got the, the historical parts of the fairs, which you've seen all the interviews I talked about a lot, all of the massive historical exhibits that I think were actually creating history. They were actually, this was like before television and movies, this was your propaganda machine of this is the message uh, we want of history being told, and they, they, they created them at these fairs. It's that time frame, 1850 to 1915, you're dealing with seemingly a reset. I used the word in the book before there was ever this word showed up in our modern vernacular now, that it seemed like somewhere in the 1800s, perhaps a huge amount of the world's population was eliminated, and these fairs were like the, the, the stepping stone back into the new, the world we'd grown up into was started with these fairs. And this was the official indoctrination of a new population with new ideas, with new expectations, with new, a, a new overview. Because at the same time, we're dealing with these bizarre world's fairs all over the world. We're dealing with these orphan trains. So you're dealing with hundreds of thousands of these orphans that no one can ever explain. Where do they come from? What happened to all their parents? Why are there all these orphans having to be put on trains? You're dealing with these giant, insane asylums being built in the 1870s and 1880s, like everywhere. Everywhere has to build like a castle palace, like for like, the, who are all these people? Why are they all insane all of a sudden? And why do you need to have these, have them in the Medici palaces of Florence equivalents? All of this stuff is happening at the same time. You've got these cities that are being, that are burning down all over, like especially North America. Every city comes through an, an unreal fire that supposedly wipes out the whole city. And then in a year later, it's all rebuilt. Right. Everything about this time period, when you dig into it, is so, it's just the narrative is so unbelievable that I can't believe me as a historian, I didn't question it until like a couple of years ago. Like, I'm almost like, where was I for 30 years to have missed all this? Right. Yeah, and it's it's, you know, as you say, very strange fires seem to be in, you know, just ubiquitous in our American history. And then when you hold that up against this speculative theory that a lot of these buildings were already here, seems like the case is that they were managing, you know, trying to manage all of this stuff that was here. Uh, before people got wise enough to maybe realize that there was a larger story. And, and how do they do that? By filling some of these buildings up with literally insane people. I mean, that's debatable on how insane and why they became that way. But then also taking children, bringing them to a whole new place. I mean, to me, that sounds like a great way to reset a place. You know, you put a bunch of kids in there and then you teach them, you know, the history is, oh, yeah, there were some cowboys and Indians that fought here and then they all left. But welcome to Oklahoma City. Like, you know, it just it seems like a little too, too suspicious to just go, oh, yeah, this is how the West was settled. Right. It's exactly that's you would start with children and you would start with a few people that are in on the game. And they'll believe anything you tell them, particularly if they've gone through trauma and difficulty before that, and all of a sudden you make them feel safe, they'll definitely believe anything you told them, right? Well, it's so, also, it's also, sorry to, to maybe yeah. go on a, a different tangent, but it's also interesting to note that the first World's Fair was started in 1791 in by the Habsburg monarchy in Bohemia, right? And people, you know freak out about Bohemian Grove and Adam Weissop, the founder of the Bavarian Illuminati was from this area. But it's interesting that this Leopold II was the first person to kind of put something like this together. It wasn't quite the same World's Fair that we had here in the States, but it was the first of its kind. Have you looked into the, the origins of the World's Fair oh, idea? Yeah. 
Oh, of course. Uh, you know, like yeah, there's, we have these stories where they had these, and particularly these books that I, we talk about. These books like to, they like to present the history of fairs. And it's very weird when you re read how they write about it. The language that they use is really weird to, to present it. It's always a ceremony. It's always of a ceremonial place. It's always, you know. Right. So it was the Chicago Exposition, the St. Louis Exposition, a ceremonial place. I think it was. But anyway, so you, you have these fair, but it was really fairs in, in Paris in like in the time of Napoleon. He was very important in, in, in taking these bigger fairs and making them even bigger. He felt this was absolutely critical to the, uh, to the presentation of France. But the first one that we have is a, what we can call a true world fair is 1851 in London in the, in the very weird Crystal Palace. And it's strange because it's like, it's almost like that's a marker. A few people have said, like, if there's a year zero, it might be 1850. Because mm -hmm. if you look what our, at least what our history tells us, and of course you can't hold really, I now hold very little is totally true in history, but the way history tells us before 1850 and the 50 years before that, we've gone through the French revolution. You've gone through the, the war of 1812. You've gone through the, the comets. You've gone through the. The weird volcanoes, you've gone through the earthquakes, the Mississippi River is turned over, and then all of a sudden you have the fairs, you know? Right. So there's the Crystal Palace, right? That was supposedly built by a gardener. They didn't get an architect to build this, they got a gardener. <laughs> I thought this is this is the guy we want to design this. And the size of it is staggering. It's staggering. <laughs> Wow. Yeah. The gardener uh, grew all that glass in his garden. <laughs> that's, uh, that's, again, you know, the materials, where are they coming from? And then you hear people say, you know, we just don't build like that today. I heard your, your the story uh, that you tell often of, of the contractor that you're friends with, who kind of is, is equally baffled by this. And this is somebody who's in that industry, understands how these great big projects get done in the modern age. If we're going to go with this narrative that we're told that things get progressively more advanced over time, then why is it that these structures are completely unexplainable? I mean, three layers there, and then there, <laughs> the the level of detail. I mean, obviously this is a drawing, folks, but you can get a photo. Go, you go, you yeah. you, you can actually get they have photographs of it, so you can actually get a real photograph of the of, the, of that one from eighteen ninety from eighteen fifty one. And you can just show people how, how pretty much insane it is to say a crystal, like crystal palace or something. What's interesting is there were like 10 crystal palaces around the world that had world fairs in the first 20 years. All of them burned down. Every single one burned down. There's the second one. Yeah, that's, that, it, that is an actual photograph of the crystal palace in England. Wow. Yeah. So 1851. So this is even before we're dealing with the giant fairs that are being built that are a thousand acres of, you know, spectacular building. This is the starting point was this. And uh, even just this, how do you build that in 1851? Right. And again, this was supposed to be built, I think, in like, you know, six months or something. Oh, yeah. I mean, it, you know. Yeah, you see the interiors, right? They've got like trees in the interior. Yeah. They, this is another one right here. This one, this is Metroplexing 1851. Just a little bit up. If you go one layer up, there was another, like, just keep scroll the screen up this a little one? further. No. no, a little further. One more layer, one more layer. One more, yeah, that one. That's another good one of looking at the, at the side of it. It's just, it, it's incredible. So that's just, that in itself is impossible to explain. But then once you start going into the fairs, like once you look into, yeah, what's happening in Chicago and St. Louis and Buffalo, and like Buffalo, like nothing against the city of Buffalo. I went to Buffalo many times. I've had really good time. Like just pull for fun, pull up the Buffalo World's Fair because there's, there's a really good example of like a city you wouldn't normally think of as holding a world. There's one going on right now. It's happening like today in Dubai. The 2020 World's Fair is happening right now in Dubai. It's really weird, first of all. The Buffalo but, one was so unnotable that they didn't even name it. They named it the Pan American Exposition. So, yeah, that's because yeah. it was supposed to be trying to, to create this north and south, the connection of north and south uh, America. Right. But if you look at the buildings, if you call up the buildings for people, just from the Buffalo Fair. So we're not even now talking about St. Louis that had a thousand acres and San Francisco that had these massive buildings. When you actually look at the at the buildings of the of the Buffalo World's Fair, they are in themselves. How does this get built in Buffalo? You know, right. there you go. Here's some of the buildings you see below. The electrical tower. 
the electrical tower is 315 feet high. And the, the, the explanation that's given, if you ask the historian or the person who's following this, that they're saying they built all this out of wood and plaster known as staff. <laughs> they, they, they went up so quickly because you can have staff plaster. Now, this building that you're looking at had an elevator on the inside that could take people to the top so that you could go to these top areas and look out over the entire, the entire fair. You're and, telling me you're going to have elevators and taking people to the top of a building that's made out of wood and plaster? <laughs> yeah. I guess like, how fast is that going to collapse? Sounds like a plaster disaster. Just that. How long would that take today, right now, was a workforce of 5,000 guys to build wow. just that one thing. And then you start adding everything else at the fair, you know, everything else that's being built in Buffalo, you know, the ethnology building, or the, I think that's next to the, I think the temple of music is the one beside it. That's where president McKinley was shot. So you had, a, you had an actually assassination of a president right? in this building here. Wow. I think the one beside it, I think this is the ethnicity building. I think the one beside temple of music, but even still. Wow. Like, look at the, the the structure of these buildings. And again, they're claimed to be, like, you know, like a movie set. Claimed to be the way you would build a movie set. This is uh, this is what you would, you would just build it out of wood and plaster. Which is true if you just need an exterior, if you're just having an exterior and you're doing stuff on the front and all you need is a facade. But if you're using the building, like here, the Temple of Music, that was like an opera house, right? So are you going to build a giant opera house with like, you know, thousands of elite coming to hear, you know, important events and, and, and maybe have it collapse and kill them all. Well, and the opera, they're very much worried about how the sound is reflecting through the building, right? So if you're building this out of wood and plaster in comparison to maybe stone or natural materials that are a little more solid, you're not going to get that same resonance in that building for a, for a beautiful opera anyways. You can see at the top top line, it says the structure, like most of the other buildings of the exposition, was demolished when the fair ended. So <laughs> everything but one building, they always keep one. One always stays. It becomes an art museum or a history museum. Everything else is destroyed. Right. Now, like St. Louis, for example, that was a thousand acres. I, I think that's about four square kilometers of buildings. And they blew them up and they said they threw them into landfills. The first thing I'd want to know is, well, what land, where are those landfills? Because I'd like to go dig them up because if they're not, if they're wood and plaster, there'll be nothing there. If there are, if they're stone, like I think they are, they won't have, they won't have, you know, weathered. Right. They'll still be, they'll still be there. Like the St. Louis fair was, was, I mean, you get a, you get a look at some of the buildings in St. Louis. I mean, th this thing is just immense. Right. Like it's just immense. A thousand acres of this. Again, all built in two years. Built and in two years with no modern machines. So I have to say my last video, because I just did a video, because Keanu Reeves is starring in a new movie, right? On the Chicago World's, or, or not movie, a, a TV series. They're putting together a TV series on the book, Devil in the White City, on the Chicago World's Fair. And I don't think that's by accident. I think people like myself have been putting enough pressure on the narrative because People, I mean, John Levy and, and Michelle Gibson and, you know, Campbell and a whole lot of other people have been talking about fairs for a long time. And it gets a tremendous amount of interest from people. I, you know, I just put up a fair video. I'm going to get five or 10,000 people. I guarantee people are interested to hear about this stuff. They, they, they sense something is wrong with these fairs. And now as things have really started to build, I mean, here I've had a book out for a couple of years that's, you know, presenting this stuff. I think I've pushed the narrative enough that now is the time to, because I guarantee a big part of this TV series will show how the buildings were all made, how it was all done, all made out of staff, all made out of wood. Don't ask any questions. Right. And, and I brought up some other really good ones, like the, the Jackson Park site where the Chicago Exposition was is a swamp. Like it's an actual swamp. They supposedly built all of the structures, like the manufacturer's building, which could hold 300,000 people, was all built on wooden pilings. So built on pieces of wood that are driven into the swamp to hold these buildings up. So it's not just we've got like hundreds of these buildings all sitting on pieces of wood to not sink into the swamp. What? And and then 300,000 people are going to come and add weight to that? I mean, I don't know if everyone listening has a swamp by them, but I live in a very marshy area and you're not walking in a swamp. Like you need like snow boots on to, to walk through this mud. <laughs> yeah. So... 
yeah, so you've got that to contend with. You've got questions like suppose like the electricity at the the electric there was more lights at the Chicago Exposition than all of New York City. So the um, first of all, the amount of lights that are at this thing is staggering. More importantly, where they generate the power from. Right. They're never really showing the power plants of where this is supposed to be generated. And how and there's no above ground wiring. So how is the how are you getting the wiring? which would be supposedly under the ground in a swamp in 1893 to not have the electrical wiring get like shorted out and wet. There should be, con we should hear constantly fuses being blown, the electricity, the power going out, this should have been, so there's no plastic, so you can't, there's no plastic invented yet, so you can't wrap them in plastic. So how are you moving the electricity? <clears throat> like as you begin to really start wrapping, like I say, wrap your head around it and none of it makes sense. Right. I was just lucky because I had these building contractors, like you said, who I went to see at the beginning, and they were able to, like you said, give me the, the, the from modern building eyes, how impossible this whole thing actually is. What is the answer? I don't know. Like you say, I, I left two mostly in the book, one being they had a, a building technology they're not supposed to have, and sort of it was forgotten afterwards. That's one possibility, like 3D printing and whatever. The second was that... A, a large number of the structures were from an ancient civilization. I kind of moved to that theory in my book, I guess, because I liked it the most. It, it's the most, it linked most to my own research and past. So I presented that a lot of the buildings might have been ancient civilization that has been, like you say, eliminated. But now I'm wondering about a third option, much, much more clearly. And that is maybe this really is the time of the reset, really, and that these things weren't built or found. They were literally programmed in. That something to do with whoever the programmers are of this simulation of this matrix world needed to restart everything. So needed to put these in almost like computer computer chips almost into the simulation to get a certain thing restarted or regoing or redoing whatever. And I'm wonder. I'm now starting to wonder. Were they literally just programmed in? It's kind of like you're talking about how you move things on your shelf on the back and. Maybe that's what some of these were. I mean, literally now I've gone from thinking I've got some pretty good answers about these fears to now starting to more and more begin to wonder. I don't think I know anything about them. They are so strange. Well, what can explain the presence of these buildings and then their subsequent removal? It just seems like if they were stumbling upon an ancient civilization would we have more record of that from like, you know, the settlers and whatnot and the people who weren't part of maybe like a Smithsonian or Freemason group, the people who were just around, you know, they can't keep a lid on everybody. You know, where did they come from? A lot of the people in the Tartaria sort of speculative realm say, well, it was the mud flood and there was all this mud and all the buildings were, you know, caked in mud and then they just came and they dug them all out and you know threw a party inside of them and then destroyed them you know it's like to me that that might you know i just it just doesn't satisfy me you know and the simulation theory idea is it's not new to me but i also i have a hard time going there what kind of was a weird angle that i wanted to take with it was what if the French were in this part of the area, and I don't want to pin it totally on the French, but just because of the Louisiana Purchase, we know that there was a lot of activity going on here. What if that activity went further back than we thought, and maybe there was there were people who had always lived in the United States that were kind of slightly on the fringe part of the rest of the world just through trading, and then Napoleon came and kind of was like, oh, this is all mine now. And then the Americans bought it from him and were like, all right, well, we can't keep this here because people will know that this land isn't ours and it's really someone else's. That That's just where my mind goes, but it, maybe that's too conventional. I don't know, but I mean, the, the answer to these are probably little pieces of everything. I don't mm. think there's one answer. I right. think little pieces of it fit together. I don't doubt that, and like I say, I wished I was still in close contact with the native medicine men that I used to know because I'd love to ask them more questions, like show them these buildings and say, is there any history left in your oral tradition that talks about giant ancient structures and civilizations in this part of the world when you're all supposed to be living on horses on the plains and in teepees? 
you know, is there any story where you used to live in these buildings and you were like, you know, kicked out of them kind of, I'd right. like to see, first of all, if there's any, like you say, is there record in, in the native tradition of that? Well, one thing that comes to mind with that is we had passed a guest on the show, Corey Daniels, who talks about the Phoenix area of Arizona and how the Hohokam people who lived there before it was settled built these very deep channels to channel water into the desert from the various rivers around the Phoenix area. So there is some sort of, I mean, evidence that there was a group of people using, you know, the advanced enough techniques to be able to build these water channels. But, you know, what that says about, you know, neoclassical looking courthouses that are, you know, adorned with edifices of various classical gods. I mean, it's just like, you know, makes you scratch your head. Who Who is also following this culture, you know, like the, the cultural significance is there. It's not like we're seeing alien gods on the sides of these buildings. Yeah. And, and, and again, for people who live in the United States, I always tell them this, it's like, you have a, a great opportunity to research where you are, particularly if you're in the middle of the country and West, mm. because your, your time frame from like the Mississippi and West is supposed to be like only a couple hundred years. There should be, there should be nothing out there before that, right? It should be just Indians and traders. So go and see your state capital in whatever, you know, whether it be Oklahoma or Iowa or it doesn't matter. The, the, the building will be spectacular. Like it will be a giant domed, beautiful Greco-Roman structure, usually built in like 1820 or 1830 or something when there's like a hundred people living in this place. And you have to ask yourself, one, why would you build that 170 years ago? And then two, how did you build that 170 years ago when you have no infrastructure, no roads, no, no, no way even access to materials. Where does all this stuff come from? And why do you need that particular building? So for me, that that's a great example that people have right now, where no matter how weird the world is, you can still in your state, go look at your state capital and ask, how did, when did they build it? What's the story? Look at the old photo, the oldest photographs you have of it. And it'll always often be just sitting in the middle of nowhere with like, yeah, just mud surrounded by mud and no roads anywhere. That's the other one that's always so much fun for me. They, they, they build these structures, but they don't think to take time to build a road first to make bringing the materials in easier, which would be no brainer. First thing you do, right? Well, yeah, absolutely. Never mind the fairs, even just trying to explain all these state capital buildings, you're, you're stuck. Right. Yeah, I mean, one that sticks out in my local area is here in New Haven, Connecticut. The courthouse has what seems like Roman gods next to naked boys next to another a sort of Caesar-looking figure in a chair and, again, naked boys. So I don't know what that says about New Haven in general, but it's just weird, weird stuff you can find on the sides of these buildings. Not just the front, you know. Yeah, little... I just looked at it. I just pulled it up. It actually has a very, first thing I look at, it has a very much a feeling of the pan, of the of Pantheon, of Parthenon in Rome. Right. Just from the size of it, it doesn't, of course, from the sides, it, but to the front, it's got a very similar front as the as the Parthenon. But the, the just, I mean, I'm not looking at the, at the, I can't tell what this actual size is, but when I, when I just look at a side view of it, it's almost like that's a pretty similar layout as, as the Parthenon. Mm, interesting. Yeah, I, I always get hung up on those weird images at the top there. But then there's, I think there's two figures sitting in front. One of them is a Roman god and the other one is, is like Plato or something. It's not a god, it's, it's just a person. But yeah, it is interesting, you know, you wonder if there was maybe, you know, more of a larger presence of groups like the the Canaanites or the sorry the other one that starts with a P and I always the Phoenicians you know because it seems like this iconography fits within their culture and if they were traveling outside of the west across the Atlantic who knows maybe they had some kind of ancient building technique to the point about the roads doesn't seem like they're using a modern one because that's step one. You you need to get your materials to the location. Uh, and unless you're floating them in, that's going to come well, on a road. Sure. I, I would say now, after all the research I've done, that if, if, we're, if I'm going to go with the ancient civilization tag, mm. if I'm going to go with that theory as, as the main theory, then I'm saying it's, it's 
worldwide, it's all the same civilization. So what we know is Greco Rome, Greece and Rome is one civilization, not separate civilizations. And that civilization is worldwide. It may have had different names. There would have been a different name for that civilization in North America, but there's still, it's still the same connected group of people, you might say. Right. And again, I think that's another thing history has done is, is by giving different names and different timelines, we, we are deflected from what's going on. So for me, I don't think the Cathars were eliminated in the 1200s and the Knights Templar in the 1300s. I think that all happened at one time. That was one event. They, they, they got rid of both of them at once. Right. Like and these, these groups don't evolve in a vacuum, basically. Like right. there's no isolated, you know, they didn't all come to the same conclusion from separate means. It, it's, it's a very much of a, a spreading out from one central source. Yeah, or at least you might call it worldwide tapping into the same source. You can think okay. of it that way. That it's, it's the same because again, once you know, that's really what Power of Then, my Egyptian book, was all about. It was the main point I tried to make. I would rewrite it completely differently now, right? Of course, but what I was trying to say was that there's a set of symbolism. There's a set of uh, geometric knowledge, and if you can figure out, if you can learn to understand what the symbols mean, what the what the what the, the mathematics is telling you then you can open up any religious text. You can go to any building anywhere in the world and through the understanding of the, because the symbols don't change. It's like they all come from the same source. So when you figure out what, what you're, what, what's being linked to in the source, then you can go anywhere and begin unraveling just about anything. Right. And that was kind of my point. So for me, always, I've always carried that forward. It doesn't matter what culture I look at or where, where I go. When you start, you see the same symbol, the same the same iconography everywhere. So, you know, they're, they're telling you the same thing. They're telling you the same thing, slightly altered maybe in different parts of the world, but it's still at the core of the same. And my guess is it's because they're all linking to the same source. They're all linking to the same origin. Right. Somewhere. Right. And you mentioned Easter Island a while ago. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I'm remembering correctly why you mentioned it, but I was having a Congo script, yeah. Right, right. So I'm wondering, you know, obviously the antediluvian angle plays a big role in this whole argument, right? Because if there was less water on the earth, there would be more of a connectivity, supposedly, and maybe even, you know, create that probability of a more connected global culture who had, you know, more than just the Parthenon, they had places like, you know, the courthouse in Tennessee or the courthouse in, in Wyoming or wherever that just seem out of place. But yeah, how far into that do you go, especially given that you've spent some time in Egypt? I mean, there's evidence, right, on the Sphinx that there was a significant amount of water at one point in that area. Right. Like, if you, if you look carefully, like, you'll find uh, either Buddhist Buddha statues in on the Giza plateau in a couple of tombs. It, it's quite obvious. Would you study if you study Buddhism, you you can't the, 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 it's obvious that's a Buddhist. That's a seated Buddha is what that is. If you go to Mexico, uh, you find tons of ancient Egyptian looking things. You find tons of Hindu looking things. You find tons of you know you've got the negroided skulls from of Africans, the Olmec skulls. You've got the so you have this constant interconnected things that aren't even separate to the, the civilization. And again, the, the, the people, the archaeologists in charge of this do their best to chop out the stuff that asked, that would ask too many questions. They don't like to show that. I think it's from the temple of the tomb of Idu on the Giza plateau. I think that's where the Buddha statue is. They, they, they try to make sure that photo doesn't make it in any of the books because too many people would say, that's a Buddhist, that's a, that's a Buddhist statue. What are you talking right. about? Why are they building that? So it's another one of these things that as you begin to go around the world and study this closely, because that's, that's the great challenge. And I think it's one of those things that's really saddens now is that because travel is almost non-existent anymore, you can't do it. Pretty much can't travel now. And the only way you can study an ancient site is to be there. There's a lot of really good channels on the internet that are on YouTube that are doing really good work on studying ancient sites and whatever, but it's through Google Earth. And you can't study, you can't study the Red Pyramid at Dashur from Google Earth. You have to be in it and have the experience of it and feel the stone and, 
and 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 do the sound test because in in the in the main there's many chambers doshers amazing period the red period but when you're in one of the rooms if you sound in three of the corners you get almost no sound there's almost no vibration but in the fourth corner it like turns on like the whole is a sound is in the whole room so it's like all these little things you have to have been there to experience to have touched and felt and smelled so it's one of the most important things when it comes to if you're going to study any of these sites is you have to go there and you have to see it feel it and experience it and look at it and and it doesn't matter what country you live in you have these sites available like i mean how many people that live in the united states and central have gone to see cahokia in st louis how many people have gone to see the serpent mound in ohio and there's mounds all over mississippi like georgia and and alabama you know we've got the You've got the Anasazi sites in 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 Colorado and New Mexico. A lot of people, I think, are interested in material, are interested in in trying to understand things, and they forget. Like they think, I have to go see the the Great Pyramid. That's the only thing I can go. And it's like, just out your back door, thirty minutes from where you live, probably is a place that you kind of know about, but you never thought about. Well, maybe I should go there and spend some time and see if there's an See if there's an energetic component to something that seems kind of simple on the surface, but might be might hold a ton of secrets for you if you just go. And especially now when traveling anywhere is getting harder and harder and harder, what's out what's in your area that you can go to and experience like today? Right. And I, I love that you're making that point because your friend, my friend Michael Wan and I talk a lot about this on our show, Your Handbook for the Apocalypse. You know, we're not trying to write a handbook to prepare people from, you know, nuclear devastation. The apocalypse is this change, you know, the world is changing. And I think one of the most enriching things I've done and what I hope to share with this show and that show is exactly that, that curiosity for place and, and to explore the metaphysics of your local area and the landscape, the energies. And, you know, being in New England, I've found that the megalithic sites are under wraps, you know, Gungi Womp, you need uh, permission, you need like a, a, a chaperone to go and visit. And yeah, that probably keeps the site protected, which I appreciate. But at the same time, you know, to call up some you know, archaeologists to give you a tour of Gungi Womp. It's a lot different than how I did it. I don't recommend people do this, but trespassing and, and finding it myself in the woods, it was magical. You know, it really was something unbelievable. And then this year, you know, that was some years back when, you know, that felt a little safer. But this year I've been just driving around trying to learn as much as I can. And, and I haven't visited as, as many stone sites as I'd like to, but I'm getting a good grasp on where they are. So, yeah, I hope that, you know, one day I'll have a lot more to say about all that. And, and maybe, you know, we can talk more about stone circles because I'm sure there's a lot of parallels between what you see up there in Norway and what I'm seeing here in New England. You know, we touched on that Templar connection briefly, but the Vikings were very much, you know, a part of the both areas, you know, this area and that one. Um, so, yeah, I second that, Howdy. And I, I got to thank you because this has been a really inspiring, uh, thought provoking. And, I, you know, I'm just so curious now to just get in my car and start driving somewhere you know it is it is the middle of the day here so i'm getting a little froggy but but yeah tell us about your books you got the power of then falling for truth exposing the expositions and and what you got something in the in the works what's coming next what can people expect yeah, so from mr mikowski three books are if you uh, google or use my name on amazon at least you can go and get an overview of the books of course you don't have to buy them there if you want to there's lots of other places you can buy them you know, i don't like to buy stuff in there either but that's a good place to go and check them out uh the exposing the expositions there's a new revised edition i still apparently got some typos in there there's still some spelling errors that apparently still even though it's a revised edition snuck in so i'm going to keep cleaning i'll keep cleaning the book up kind of forever but that's the one you want it's, it's it, I, I put in a lot of stuff about 2021 where we were at the time as well, along with the fairs. So, so you can go there. My YouTube channel is still running, right? Howdy Mikoski Talks is still, for now, up and, and moving. And I was thinking about, I had another book I've been kind of contemplating. 
really going into the, the, the story of the presentation of Plato's cave, <laughs> the reality we were in and the, and the, the misperception that we experienced. I thought about writing a novel, actually trying to do a novel. I'd never written a novel before. And the challenge for me is I'd have to reconnect to this uh, very creative person that I talked to way at the beginning of the show. Right. I couldn't write a novel. The, per the guy sitting here, the very unfunny guy, could not be creative enough to write a novel. The old comedian who's like left in the death experience and the creative person who's kind of having some of that die in the university, that would have to come out if I'm going to write a novel. But I've got a couple of other ideas of how I might do that. And I'm kind of still in the process of, one, do we need another book? That's the first question I'm really asking because in two to three years, when everybody is plugged into the metaverse and it's literally not in this reality anymore, they're literally getting um, sucked into the other reality. Will people, have, will people have read books? Will they be able to read? Will they, will they be allowed? Will you know, because that's one of the things, as you build a virtual new reality, and if that's where everyone is and the information is, then who programs that controls the information that's available? Right. I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even surprise me if once this, whatever the alternate reality, everyone's going to get attempted to be plugged into, right? Like, obviously not you and me, we're not going to get in there, but the rest of the people, maybe they'll give them a new language, the new language in the new realm. So once you and especially the kids, once the kids are all focused on the new, all the old languages will be forgotten. And then even if they can, even if they get out of that place and have a stack of books like are behind you, well, they couldn't read them anyway. Right. They would be useless. They don't know the language. So I'm actually at step one thinking, do we need another book? And then if we need another book, well, maybe it's better to, to actually do the book as like, as like art drawings, because at least artists, you know, some sort of picture or drawing will might might last longer in the future, even though it's less it's less specific. You more have to you know feel your way into it, like ancient art, like a Renaissance painting. But it's more likely that it'll be there and could be accessed. So I'm literally at that point of I don't actually know what to do next because I'm not sure. Well, I think what you just said is brilliant, Howdy. I mean, the idea that we can rewrite our language to be more visual almost seems like going back to what the ancients were doing, which seems to be very uh, successful considering we're able to somewhat translate them with confidence, right? And, you know, they're not totally lost. So yeah, I mean, geez, I hadn't even thought of that. This dystopian future where they might erase our language. But in that case, yeah, I think visual language is, is the only way around it. And and you're pointing out another thing. Well, that's why I have all these books, Howdy, because when I was a kid, I saw the internet and I remember the experience of loving a website and then going to it one day and it's just gone. And I'm like, what? I like that information and I didn't save it. What's wrong with me? You know? So books are kind of like my compulsory way of of having a lot of security for these ideas. Right. You know? Challenges, of course, they're getting rid of books from all the libraries. They're right. putting them on the internet now. Right. And then they're literally destroying the books. And once it's in digital form, it can be changed just like that. Wow. Things can be taken out. Things can be removed. Things can be, you know, literally. And you'd have no idea because if you don't have the original source material, you know, you can't check that what you're, what you're reading is the original actual original written material. It's another reason why they're going that route. So, however, then we deal with, we don't want to get it because we stop the interview, but we're dealing with like the Mandela effect where we're starting to realize that the possibility that things like that, if, I'm, if they can change a line in a movie, they can change a line in a book. Right. So we're also at the point like, how, how do we know for sure? I, I mean, boy, do I wish just for tests. I had, remember those old cameras that had the the Polaroid that would come out, you'd take the oh, picture yeah. and then the, you automatically get the thing, you know, didn't need film. I wished I had taken a whole bunch of Polaroids of various movies, of various books, of various <laughs> whatever, kept them and then checked them today to see, because it seems like with this Mandela effect stuff, they can change the original, but anything that linked to the original is so far not changed. So like the Star Wars movies, a line about Luke, you're my father, that's changed in the movie. But if you watch James Earl Jones on an interview talking about the line that we all remember, that's that's the one he uses. 
So all of these things are, like you say, for looking for the future, for how, how do we want to preserve knowledge going forward? Uh, it's part of what I've been thinking about when we're ending this is if I'm going to do something else, if I'm going to put a tremendous time and effort, because it really is writing anything or putting anything artistic together with knowledge is a huge amount of effort and time. I don't want to put a whole bunch of time, six months or eight months of effort, and then realize it can't be used in like six months. They're, they're useless to the world. I'd rather either work on myself fully and help a few people, or if I'm going to create something, at least feel like in 2040, it still might be here in some form and somebody could access it if possible. So I guess I'll leave it there. Well, I think that's a noble effort, a very wise way to go about that. Uh, maybe we could put you in touch with some comic book artists. That might be interesting. I have a, f a friend uh, who runs a, a sort of conspiracy comic book company. So maybe maybe that might be of interest moving forward with that novel idea because graphic novels are very popular for sure yeah, these days. It's not a bad idea where you combine the text with, with images. Mm. I'd love to help, Howdy. Your friend, your friend of Mike's, your friend of mine, you know, and this has been a real pleasure going through not just your life, but civilization. I mean, there's so many little roads of, you know, or avenues of interest that we can go down with this conversation. And I think we touched on a lot of things that I wasn't expecting to, specifically the Micmacs. I'm still, I mean, that was only 20 minutes in that we talked about that and, and that's going to stick with me for a while. So howdy, this has been so much fun and I hope you have a great moment wherever you are in the now. Thank you for listening folks and be sure to go over to howdy's website, egyptian-wisdom-revealed.com. Check out the books, check out his videos articles and everything else to stay in touch with what howdy's doing and uh, hopefully a, a graphic novel is on the way but until next time folks thanks for tuning in and howdy thank you again brother all right thank you for sticking with us here in the extended outro what a conversation with howdy he really knows his stuff been around the globe and back and it's cool to hear he's finding similar structures in Norway that we have here in North America because it fits right in to the Vinland map that I was talking about with my friends on the Rising from the Ashes podcast. Shout out to you guys, homie Romy and Dan Danunaki. And I also touched on it when I was on with Kyle and Puds, hosts of the Big Dumb podcast. Shout out to them. And speaking of shout outs, I want to give a shout out to Juan from the one-on-one -on -one podcast. He won a t-shirt in our t-shirt raffle, as well as Divided Being and Mr. Troy. Uh, the latter two are patrons of the show. Thank you both for your support. And Juan, thank you for sending in five bucks. You won the t-shirt. And for those who don't know, Juan, myself, and Chris from the Mensa podcast have started a new series. We're planning on doing it once or twice a month uh, where the three of us get together, uh, either just each other or with a guest. We have a really awesome guest planned for the next episode. So stay tuned for that, a new series. Uh, speaking of series, my show with Mike is taking just a, a pause for a week or two. Uh, Mike's gotten somewhat busy. But don't fret, that show will be back on track very soon. Mike and I will get together um, at the end of the month and record another episode. And Dave and I as well are planning on recording another Elemental Philosophorum in February. And we got a lot of interviews coming out in between this Howdy Mikowski interview and uh, and all of that. So we'll see. But in the meantime, the show is growing we have two new members of the Best Friend Book Club and four total new members of the Patreon. So they are all going to receive spirit animal names right now. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for listening. And if you want to support the show, because this is not a free product, I know you're listening to it for free, but uh, this is how I get paid by folks supporting us and showing us some love on Patreon or Rockfin. It's the only way to keep this show going. It's the only way to keep this show consistently on 
the air on the audio waves, man. So here we are. We got four new patrons, and I want to show them some love. The way we do that around here is by welcoming them to the family with a spirit animal name. All of you uh, who are part of the Patreon now have your very own spirit animal name. This is not your proper spirit animal. I encourage you to discover that on your own. And this doesn't come from any proper culture. It's just a fun idea that I had. It's not related to any spiritual practice of any kind. It's just fun. And we use two tarot card decks to bring some randomness into the equation. So we never know what your spirit animal name is going to be until the last moment. So I have our four patrons' spirit animal names right here in front of me. First up, shout out to Mikey from KG Up. He's friends with Alex Stein. He's friends with Donut. Uh, I know this guy. He comments in the YouTube channel all the time. Shout out to you, KG. I appreciate you, brother. Glad you found your way over to the Patreon. If everybody on YouTube signed up for the Patreon, that would be amazing because we have received a lot of of new YouTube subscribers after another patron who's a new friend, Donut, who signed up last uh, last week. After he aired our episode together, I got a whole bunch of new supporters. So thank you all for coming and showing up to the show from Donut's channel or wherever you found me, maybe through Tinfoil Hat, um, wherever it was. I appreciate you listening, and I hope you stick around for the extended intro all the way to the end, I have a funny call that I'm going to put at the end. Somebody called me about an old domain name, and I asked them some questions. I don't know. can't really call it a prank call because I turned it around on them, and they called me. But either way, here we are. Back to the spirit animal names. Mikey J, you are the Visionary Nightingale. Wow, you got the Nightingale card. And the Vision Quest card, which represents seeking and finding. Shout out to you, Mikey. You are the Visionary Nightingale. Ooh, never seen this one before. All right. Our next patron is someone I know slightly. We talked off the air. Shout out to Joe. Your spirit animal name is the Changing Gazelle. You got the gazelle card, and you got the rite of passage card, which represents change. And that is definitely significant if everything you told me is true. And I'm really, really glad you're a part of the Patreon. Thanks, brother. Next up is another fr another friend, new friend, who sent me some emails, and we talked a little bit. Shout out to the Vermont Hip Hop Collective, which is the name they're going by on the Patreon. Oh, man, and you got a good one. You got the Octopus card and the Great Smoking Mirror card, which Donut also got that card as well. So we're going to call you the Great Smoky Octopus. Now we have a Great Smoky Cheetah, a Great Smoky Frog, and a Great Smoky Octopus. Shout out to you. Welcome to the Spirit Animal Family. And last but not least is our final member, who joined, uh, most recent member who joined, I should say, not final, uh, Amber, joined the Best Friend Book Club. Shout out to you, Amber. Thank you for your support. You are, oh, wow, okay, so you got the Frog card, the Sacred Space card, which represents respect. So you are the Sacred Frog. Thank you so much for being here, Amber. Thank you to everyone who signed up for the Patreon Thank you to everyone who's supported us on Rockfin. Uh, we got some tips on Rockfin. Shout out to Jerome. Shout out to Moonwolf. Shout out to Mike M. Shout out to Cash Y. And shout out to Barb R. Thank you all so much for your generous donations on Rockfin. And then shout out to Kurt W., he ordered a necklace from my art store. You can find that in the episode description or at link tr.ee slash mftic. You find the art and the merch. 
link tab click on that and go check out the art made by yours truly i make all sorts of jewelry crystal pendants and my girlfriend tara is a painter so her paintings are there too and kurt was kind enough to order a really sweet wrap that i did a, a, i think a year or so ago uh with amber and amethyst and two pieces of tiger's eye some copper wire and even a copper bead so kurt that's on the way in the mail i promise and i also sent out some books for our best friend book club members for the last round of the best friend book club and i try my best to get it to you after your first payment some of you guys double up and pay me twice that's fine i really appreciate that and um you know you're not inclined you're not encouraged to stay in the best friend book club forever i know it's a high tier uh, but for as long or as many months as you stick around in the Best Friend Book Club, I promise to send you a book uh, to sort of pay back that value. And some of you are racking up months. You've been in the Best Friend Book Club for a while, and I appreciate that so much. So don't worry. Uh, one day, I may even be an author myself. Hint, hint. So you all will be very much included in that when that happens so if you do want to join the best friend book club but you don't want to get charged that monthly you know every time feel free to send me a one-time donation on paypal of 33 dollars, and i will send you a book if you're in canada i'm sorry it is quite expensive to ship you a book so i really you know I don't want to send you like a magazine, you know, I want to send you a, a book that you can uh, really get something out of. But obviously the heavier the book, the more expensive it is. And it's already very expensive to ship to Canada. So um, that's, you know, it's not really a warning. It's not really an apology, but it's just sort of a clarification as to why I send the books I do. Um, if you're unhappy with the book, I'm sorry. Uh, I can definitely send you another one, uh, but I just can't promise, you know, how fast I, I can send it, right? So, uh, but, you know, Best Friend Book Club at your own risk. I, I'm I'm doing this for a limited time. It's not going to happen forever uh, or otherwise I would run out of books, right? I mean, I don't want to give away all my books, but either way, the Canadian folks, I will send you, uh, you know, if you sign up, I'll send it to you. I'm just warning you. Um, it's not going to be like an encyclopedia or anything, you know, uh, be happy with what you get, be grateful. And if you're concerned with maybe, you know, what book you might get, just send me a little message about yourself and, uh, and then I'll make sure that the book is the right one for you. Cause it is interesting to just send a random book to someone that I hardly know. Um, but if you send me a little paragraph about yourself, when you sign up for the best friend book club, that's helpful. It helps me um, send the right book. And I've gotten to know a couple of you through the Telegram chat, which is what I want to talk about next. Join up into the Telegram. There's so many Telegram groups, and there's so much going on on Telegram. I don't blame you if you haven't joined yet, but our Telegram chat is growing. It's growing so fast that we now have a patron-only Telegram. So if you are supporting the show and you're not in that patron-only Telegram yet, which I know a uh, good percentage of you, almost 60% of you are not. That's fine if you're not a Telegram user, but it is a fun little community, and I'd love to have as many uh, of you in there as possible. So if you don't have Telegram yet, consider downloading it. It's basically just a chat app. And, uh, and join in that Patreon-only exclusive Telegram chat. It's a lot of fun. And we just did our first annual te uh, Patreon zoom meeting and eight of you lovely folks showed up we had an awesome conversation troy won a t-shirt uh, live in person juan and divided being also won t-shirts that night and it was a lot of fun everybody shared a little bit about themselves and we all got to know each other really well um and i'm looking forward to the next one it was a lot of fun so Sign up for the Patreon if that sounds like something you want to be a part of. And, you know, don't uh, disable those notifications because 
we have uh, quite a bit of people in the Patreon and, and only eight of you showed up. Uh, so don't worry. You hadn't missed out. We will be doing another one next month and I hope to see you there. Um, I guess that's about it for today, folks. I mean, I really, I can't promise I'll have a guest for every extended outro. It'll probably be the Wednesday episodes that have a guest on the extended outro and then the monday episodes like this one will be just me just chatting talking talking about messages that i receive from you guys and trying to stay as organized as possible so i can actually um, respond to all these messages that i get and remember if you want to send me a voice message sign up on the telegram join into the telegram and that's the best way to send me a voice message. I, you know, I want to be able to play them on the show. And Telegram is free. You just hit record on your phone. Uh, hopefully you're not driving. Hopefully you're not um, in a room with a bunch of racket or a loud, noisy area. Try to, you know, do your best to record the best quality audio you can. But yeah. Send me a, a little message on the Telegram. Tell me why your family thinks you're crazy. I think that would be fun. Oh, and another thing. I set up a Teespring, and it's really funny. I put some designs on the Teespring, and some of them are still there. So go and check out those Teespring designs and maybe buy a shirt. Uh, supports the show. It helps me out big time if you buy a shirt. So go and check out the Teespring. But it was interesting uh, the Teespring said that some of our designs did not fit within their content guidelines. Uh, the One of the shirts said, my family thinks I'm crazy because I researched the real Tesla. That one got disabled. The other one said, psyops are everywhere. Um, my family thinks I'm crazy. And that one got disabled. And then the other one, which I was probably going to delete this one anyways because I didn't really like the way it looked, was uh, occult symbols are everywhere. It got disabled from Teespring. Meanwhile, the ET Sasquatch design is there. The ET friend or foe design is still there. The My Family Thinks I'm Crazy logo shirt is still there. Um, our Government is Shady t-shirt is still there. And the Synchro Mystic Wizard t-shirt and gear are all still there. So it's I'm a little confused. I would think that the Our Government is Shady shirt would also go uh, the way of the other ones that got disabled, but we'll see, folks. Uh, order them before it's too late. Who knows? Um, another shout-out to Donut. Donut ordered our bold MFTIC design, which, in all honesty, I put there just as a test, and Donut liked it, and he bought it, and I hope he takes a bunch of pictures of himself wearing it and puts it on Instagram and shows shows some love for the podcast. And then maybe I'll buy a donut t-shirt and do the same. Who knows? Possibilities are endless. So many shout outs, so little time. Uh, we talked about the Teespring. We talked about all this stuff. Who sent me a message recently? Let's see. We got some good messages recently. Um, let me go back into... The little archives here and see. All right, so let's go. So some of some of you have reached out and shared some really cool stuff with me lately, um, and a lot of you also then just signed up for the Patreon. So I guess I already kind of gave you a shout out. Um, shout out to Sergio from the YouTube chat, sending me a care package. I appreciate that, brother. And yeah, I guess that's it. I've been watching some Sam Hyde stuff on Gumroad. That's hilarious. Um, I watched that iDubs thing with Sam Hyde. That was funny. Had kind of a rough week. I want to do these extended outros some justice. And I want to give you guys more content. Shout out to Pete C, my homie in Colorado. Because I know homies like Pete C are listening while they're at the gym. And they're working out. And they got their hands are all sweaty. And then they reach into their gym shorts. 
and then their gym shorts fall down, and then they're like, shit, I got to pull my pants back up, and then they're like, oh, damn, I got to grab my phone, and then you pick your phone up, and you hit, you know, you hit the button, skip, to, like, find a podcast, and your hands are all sweaty, and then your phone screen gets all dirty. I mean, come on. So I'm going to make the episodes longer, shorter, but uh, we'll see. Who knows? The intro shorter, the outro is longer, right? That's kind of the idea. All of you who are helping on the Patreon, that's a big help. And um, and Rockfin as well, even though I'm kind of not really into crypto that much. Um, I'm figuring it out. And if anybody wants my rare Pepe NFT, um, I am going to sell it. But I, you know, you got to offer a high price. I mean, I'm talking 5G's, baby. This is a rare Pepe NFT. If you want a rare Pepe NFT owned by Mark from the My Family Thinks Some Crazy podcast, um, just let me know. Five G's. This thing's going to be worth a lot more than that. But me, I'm trying to get into an apartment, and that's what I need right now. So if you got five G's and you want NFTs, I got a very rare Pepe NFT. I actually have two of them. Um, I don't know if I want to sell both of them, but I will sell you this rare Pepe NFT for 5Gs. And I know people who don't know NFTs might think that sounds crazy, but people who know NFTs are going to be like, damn, that's a steal. That is a steal. Hit me up on Instagram at my family thinks I'm crazy. And that's, uh, how you can get that NFT. We'll hook it up. Who the hell are you? All right. Can you hear me, sir? Yes, yes. Oh, so my business is podcasting, and one of the big topics that we've been talking about lately is this whole pandemic nonsense. I mean, what do you think, my friend? We're living in crazy times. We're living in a world where they're trying to force things upon human beings that were banned in the uh, Nuremberg trials, you know, experimental medicines. What are your thoughts on that? Right. Actually, you are doing like podcasting, right? Online podcasting, correct? Correct. And I'd love to know a little bit more about what's going on. Uh, do you want to know about COVID? Yes. The current situation? Yes. Actually, the situation is not very good. Like, uh, not there is no complete lockdown here, but like after 10 p.m. in the night, there is night curfew is there. Nobody in the road. And we are in the office in with 50% population. That's all. Situation is not very good. Right. People are getting infected, died, admitted to the hospital. Doctors and nurses are get, in getting infected. Situation is not good. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely hate to hear that. That doesn't sound great. Does it make you suspicious at all that... You know, Bill Gates was all around uh, various countries, India being one of them, uh, various African countries, you know, doing these experimental trials. It seems a little suspicious to me, at least. What are your thoughts on that? Yes, yes. Okay, Mark. Nice talking to you. Okay. (laughs) So, anyways... That does it for today's show. I hope everyone out there listening has a wonderful moment wherever you are in the now. Keep your head up. Don't let anything get you down. 2022 has just begun, and we're in the season of the Capricorn. It represents hard work and all that good stuff, and you're going to see it in this show. You're going to see it in this episode. Oh, you already did. And the next episode we have coming out is with our friend Kent Woods. What do we got after that? We got a lot of great episodes coming out in the next few weeks. Brian Cote Noir was on the show. Gordy Hamill. And those are all available on Rockfin right now. Uh, so go check those out. And uh, Kent Woods. Yeah. And Patreon as well. Don't worry, patrons. I will get those up there right now. So anyways, thank you for being here. Thank you for listening and have a great